weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Shabir. And now we'll hear from 20 minutes from Dan Chen. Thank you, Shabir. It brings back uh, recollections of uh, some very dynamic dialogues we had in the UK 12 years ago. Um, and uh, just so glad that we can join together in this event tonight. Um, looking at the biblical foundations for peace, we need to go back to the Garden of Eden itself, which you also went back to that event, where Adam and Eve were created as the parents of universal humanity. We all are one humanity, all one parent. And uh, within that garden, God's plan was that Adam and Eve would live in fellowship with God and uh, care for the garden and a, a, a life of peace. But alas, Adam and Eve turned away from God. They took the forbidden tree, the fruit from the forbidden tree, and uh, declared their independence of God. They hide behind the bushes. God meets them there. And he describes for them what the consequences of this turning away from him are. And so there is a disease in the human uh, family which has wended its way through our experience generation after generation, the disease of a spirit of rebellion against God expressed in so many ways. All of us in various ways participate with that reality and broken peace between ourselves and God. However, God enters the garden and meets Adam and Eve and promises that a son born to the woman will someday come who will crush the head of the evil one and who will be wounded in the battle, but he will overcome and triumph over this evil and this brokenness. And so from the dawn of human history, there is that promise of a son who will come and who will deal with evil and with brokenness, which robs us of our peace. The prophets throughout the ages repeated that promise over and over again. Abraham is uh, one of the first to whom God revealed that as he leaves the uh, corruption of, uh, of uh, Babylonia, of, of, of the Iraqi area where he was living, of Tehran, and uh, of, 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 of that region, that he will, he will uh, um, as he leaves that, God will bless him, and he will, he will become a blessing to all nations. And so that promise is renewed again and again, that through the seed of Abraham, eventually, a Savior will come. And so I've chosen this evening, rather than survey the biblical prophets uh, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the various scriptures, such as the Torah, the Psalms, and so forth, to focus especially on this promised Messiah. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, who is the fulfillment of this promise of peace to the world and peace to the nations. His birth was a surprise. The Gospel describes his first bed as a manger in a cattle stall. He became a refugee in Egypt. In his youth and young adulthood, he worked as a carpenter. And at the age of 30 then, anointed with the Holy Spirit, he began his public ministry. He went to the synagogue in, uh, in Nazareth, as was his practice, on, on the Sabbath day when he was ready to proclaim the inauguration of his mission. And they gave him a scroll to read from, and he read from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recover his sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he sat down and he preached his first sermon. It was one sentence long. He says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Thus began his, the ministry of Jesus the Messiah. In all he said and did, he demonstrated that he is the fulfillment of God's reign of justice, righteousness, and peace on earth. His life and ministry were a revelation of the presence of the kingdom of God among us. All who were sick, 
crippled, blind, or deaf who came to him, he healed. He cast out demons, he fed the hungry miraculously, as when he broke five loaves of bread and two fish, feeding 5,000 men plus women and children. He raised at least two people from the dead. He triumphed over creation, even walking on the water when it was necessary. The Messiah welcomed sinners, and he forgave sinners, and all those who were troubled, he welcomed them. He invited, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Messiah taught with authority and confronted injustice and religious hypocrisy. He proclaimed, woe to you teachers of the law, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, these were the religious leaders, first clean the inside of the cup, and then the outside will be clean. In his Sermon on the Mount, the Messiah described the ethical foundations for the kingdom of God. Recall that God's blessing upon Abraham, recalling God's blessing upon Abraham, Jesus here describes the qualities that bring about authentic blessings. I won't read it all, but blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus also elaborated on sexual ethics, marriage, integrity, our attitude toward wealth and possessions, forgiveness of our enemies, reconciliation given to the poor prayer and fasting and not to worry. The people observed that he taught as one who had authority, not like their teachers. At the height of his popularity in Galilee, Jesus attempted, the Galileans attempted to make him become their king by force. At that time there was an insurgency in Galilee against the pagan Roman occupation. The plan of the Galileans was that Jesus would lead their underground army to victory. In Galilee, the Messiah could establish the kingdom of God and then extend its borders to the ends of the earth. He could feed the troops just by breaking bread and breaking fish miraculously. He could strike them blind and overcome this pagan idolatrous army. Jesus, the Messiah, rejected that invitation forthrightly. Instead, he went into the mountains for prayer that night. And thereafter, he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem where he told his disciples they would arrest him, mock him, insult him, spit on him, and kill him. On the third day he would rise again. The disciples objected strongly. They believed that the Messiah could not be crucified. As Jesus approached the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, he mounted a colt. The children were jubilant and they sang, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The children sang because they were acquainted with Zechariah's prophecy, a prophet who had written 500 years earlier, writing, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and, and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt the foul of a donkey. Surely the children knew this, this prophecy from Zechariah from their Sabbath school studies and they were so thankful because they loved Jesus so much that in that cult ride he is declaring that indeed he is the Messiah. We read on Zechariah's prophecy. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. His kingdom has nothing to do with military power. Zechariah proclaimed that the kingdom inaugurated by the Messiah would extend to all nations. It is a peace voluntarily received, never imposed on anyone. As Jesus came to the brow of the Mount of Olives on that donkey, he saw Jerusalem below him and he started to weep, for Jerusalem would not receive the peace. The children singing, Jesus crying. He then descended the Mount of Olives and entered the temple with his army of singing children and chased away the corrupt merchants who occupied the temple courts. 
The temple was the center of worship where Israel made regular pilgrimages. 18,000 priests and associates were required to keep the system working, and the whole religious enterprise had become a heavy burden. Jesus not only cleansed the temple in his commitment to justice and righteousness, but he also made it clear that the temple would one day be, one day be destroyed. That happened 30 years later. There was no need for a temple in the kingdom that he was inaugurating, for the people of God are the temple of God. The authorities were furious and planned his arrest. One of his disciples, Judas, turned traitor and decided to cooperate with the authorities. The night of his betrayal, Judas, uh, Jesus had a last supper with his disciples. And at the supper, he made it clear that Judas would betray him. Then he got up from the table, took a basin of water and a towel, and proceeded to wash the feet of each disciple, beginning, it seems, with Judas. The Messiah washed the feet of his betrayer. Later that night, Jesus was in prayer on the Mount of Olives when Judas and the soldiers came to arrest him. One of his disciples took a sword and struck the arresting team uh, with, uh, struck one of the members of the arresting team, cutting off his ear. Jesus rebuked Peter, saying, Put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Jesus touched and healed the stricken ear. Many accusations were hurled at Jesus in his trial. The charges about the, his cleansing of the temple and predicting his destruction were among the most damaging. He was condemned to be crucified. The Messiah said that he could muster an army of 72,000 angels to deliver him, but he would not. The next morning, Jesus was placed on a cross between two thieves. The Roman authorities put his inscription in three languages above his head. Jesus, the King of the Jews. People jeered. If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. And Jesus cried out, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Christians believe that in that cry of forgiveness, with hands outstretched, the soul of the kingdom of God is revealed. Outstretched hands seek to embrace. In the crucifixion of the Messiah, Christians believe we experience the embrace of God, who invites all to come and participate in the forgiveness and reconciliation and peace of his kingdom. Three days after his crucifixion, God raised the Messiah from the dead. In one of his resurrection appearances, he met the disciples and said, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. He commanded them to proclaim the forgiveness of sins to all people. And he commissioned them, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus met his disciples on a hill in Galilee and commissioned them, Go and make disciples of all nations. Then he ascended into heaven. As the astonished disciples were gazing into the heavens, two angels appeared to them and said, This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen, him go, you've seen him going into heaven. For the next ten days, the disciples fasted and prayed in an upper room in Jerusalem. Then on Pentecost, when Israel celebrated the first fruits of the harvest, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. People representing Every nation under heaven were in Jerusalem that day. Miraculously, as the apostles preached, they all heard the gospel in their mother tongues. That was a sign that God's kingdom of peace, of, of peace was coming upon all nations and languages. That is the birthday of the church. We have observed that the church was born within the context of Jesus the Messiah promising to return again. The mission of those who are committed to Jesus the Messiah is to continue living and proclaiming the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated in his first coming and to continue living that kingdom until his second coming. It's for this reason that the faithful church around the world is often recognized as a community who encourages justice, peacemaking, schools, hospitals, agricultural development, cultural transformation, in a humanizing direction, freedom and ministries of compassion, like Mother Teresa's nuns in Calcutta, who minister to the dying in their home for the aged and dying. I acknowledge in grief 
that the church has often betrayed its mission. Nevertheless, we give thanks for the many ways that the faithful church through the ages has been a sign of God's kingdom of justice, righteousness, and peace among the nations. God raised the Messiah from the dead. Likewise, God will raise all humanity from the dead in the final day when Jesus returns. At that time, everyone will see, uh, everyone will face the judgment of God. The scriptures say, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they did, and as recorded in the books. And God proclaims, now the dwelling of God is with men and women, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Behold, I am making all things new. Jesus often went into the hills for a night of prayer. So his disciples asked him to teach them to pray. The prayer he taught captures the essence of the messianic reign in biblical eschatology. This is the prayer Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Yes, indeed, may we pray that God's kingdom will come in our very broken and wounded world.